Hello, my name is Tina Beatty and I'm the founder and facilitator of the Catholic Women Speak Network and I'm also the director of Catherine of Siena College, an online college based at the University of Roehampton which offers courses in theology, gender and social justice. I'm delighted that you've joined us for these conversations with women from around the world about what it means to be a woman of faith in a time when we face unprecedented global challenges, struggles and opportunities. I talk to different women in different cultures and contexts to ask them how they are experiencing the coronavirus pandemic and its aftermath, some of the political and economic turmoil surrounding us and what their faith means in times like these in terms of how they rise to the challenges and what creative energies they find within themselves to be part of the movement for change that's sweeping through the world at the moment in many new and often challenging ways. If you want to find out more about any of the people I'm in dialogue with, please visit our website catholicwomenspeak.com where you can find longer biographies and you can also find the YouTube videos of the interviews and sometimes resources for reading and watching more about the people I'm in dialogue with. So welcome and I hope you enjoy this conversation. And today I'm delighted to welcome Martha Mapasure, who was a contributor to our 2018 book, Visions and Vocations. Martha is a Catholic theologian, a gender activist and a cultural anthropologist from Zimbabwe. She's also lived in South Africa. And today she's speaking to us from uh, Leuven in Belgium, where she's studying at KU Leuven. So Martha, Thank you for joining us today and welcome to this Catholic Women Speak conversation. So let's begin, Martha, by me just asking you to tell us a little about your experience of being a Zimbabwean woman living in Leuven at this time of the pandemic. How's it been for you? Thank you very much for, for having me here. Uh, I think for me, uh, my experience is from from when the pandemic started as a student as well, have been, uh, and also as a Catholic uh, woman, and as a woman, as a mother, I think it has been uh, reflecting more on the sustenance of life itself, reflecting more on, on what life is. So I think for me, when the pandemic started and people moving from doing different things, having different changes and, getting into isolation, into lockdown and everything. I think for me, I found myself thinking of how as a woman, I am sustaining life, my own life and also the lives of other women, of other people. So I think uh, staying in Louvain in Belgium for me, uh, my experiences have been more of people looking out at each other, people assisting each other during the lockdown we always had people phoning each other, even here at the residence, uh, checking out, do we have groceries, do we have this? So it, it has really been more of that. Uh, but I think for me, uh, coming from Zimbabwe and also having stayed in South Africa, I found myself facing different realities in the sense that whatever I was experiencing, I also had to think of my home, I also had to think of my son as a mother. I also had to think of my mother who is in Zimbabwe and also my family and friends who are, you know, in, in South Africa and in Zimbabwe and trying to think of what they're experiencing during this uh, pandemic. And so I think it's, it's, it was more of, of reflecting of how, finding ways and means of sustaining life. And how do I do that as a person, as an individual woman, and also as, as a group, as, as different people. So I found myself trying to reach out, of course, online uh, to different people to find strength, to find inspiration. But I think being in Belgium also brought about different realities of things like inequalities uh, in the sense of there was the idea of panic buying, people buying different things for, you know, stocking up and everything, which is a different reality from where I come from. 
that that's really fascinating because in a way you're able to compare three different cultural realities um, your experience of being in Belgium and your contacts with people in Zimbabwe and South Africa. I have a sister and her family still in Zambia and another one in Sydney. And I think for those of us who have very dis um, dispersed families, there is this astonishing sense of a sad unity, but a unity nonetheless, that this pandemic has created and that we are experiencing here in Europe what our family are also experiencing rather differently in different parts of the world. And you talk about inequalities. Have you experienced that living in Leuven itself? Because here we read that Belgium has had a very high um, rate of deaths from COVID-19, as indeed we have in the UK, well, in, in England, certainly. And I wonder how that's felt for you, coping with the very different social and economic realities that this throws up in terms of how people are coping. So I think for me, uh, inequality in the sense that the, the pandemic has affected everyone, but I think it's the reality of knowing that it has affected us in different capacities. So for example, it really like hit Belgium in a very big way. And we, we it, it was really difficult hearing ambulances and things like that. You would, you would hear it from your own room. So I think the reality was, this is what is happening. But I think the response was, for me, it was knowing that there's something which is happening. The government is doing something. They are trying by all means to, 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 to work on this, which I think uh, would be a different reality from another context, for example, from where I come from, to say in terms of government responding. So I think in as much as it, it really affected Belgium in a very big way, and it was scary even for me, but I think uh, it, it's in seeing the, the response and really seeing each one and everyone trying to do something about it and like I was saying that everyone was really looking out at each other. So, so yeah. And tell me, Martha, is there a large student community still in KU Leuven or did most people go home? Do you feel that you're still part of that student body that you were part of, obviously, when you were actively studying for your masters at KU Leuven? Yeah, that actually totally changed. <laughs> That actually changed uh, when the lockdown started. We stopped going for classes. Uh, we had classes online. And I'm a member of the Catholic Women uh, Theological Studies at the Faculty of Theology. And we had a lot of programs uh, going on, which we had to put a halt because of the pandemic. So it, it actually changed a lot of things in terms of campus life. But I also, I think it also changed a lot of things for, for myself staying at the residence and reflecting on, on what family is. Because we had a lot of Belgian students going back home to their families and we found ourselves here because you know we couldn't travel. So I think for me as a mother, as a woman, uh, I found myself reflecting on, on, on what it is to be a mother, having a child with some way and me being here in a time of crisis like this. And so I think it, it, it became more for me an issue of thinking of how do I sustain the life of my child from where I am, despite the distance. So, so in, in terms of checking out on, on how he is and also trying to find out, but I think it, it did affect me a lot to such an extent that uh, I wrote an article actually in the, the sake of consent African women theologians uh, came up with a project uh, where they talk about the COVID-19 Women's Voices Project. So, which is a platform which they try to give women space to, to share their stories uh, during the lockdown, during the pandemic. So I wrote a, a, a small piece when I was reflecting of, of motherhood and being far away from your own child and thinking of how you sustain life, the life of your child, and also thinking of how as mothers, as women, women, we are the ones who give life. Therefore, we have to sustain that life. So it, it, it's it's thinking of it from 
we need to sustain life from where we are. You don't necessarily have to be in a place, but it's, it's, it's what, in what you do in, in different things, in different ways. So I found myself really uh, thinking about motherhood a lot. And I think it also brought, was brought into reality with the different things which are happening. So for example, I take a story which I found on Twitter about a, this Kenyan woman who unfortunately didn't have food during the lockdown, which was a reality for a lot of women in my context. So she found herself boiling stones, you know, boiling some stones to give her kids hope to say there's a meal which is being cooked because she, she, she didn't have the food. So this is the reality she had. So I found myself thinking about all those things and thinking of how many women could be going through the same issue, through the same reality. So, so I think of how as women, we need to really look out at each other. We need to really like get involved in each other's lives to such an extent that I, I don't think in as much as there are inequalities, I don't think it should come to that extent that someone can boil stones to give their kids hope until they fall to sleep to, without having food. So these are the kind of realities that a lot of people are going through. And also I found myself reflecting on, of course, the George Floyd story and thinking of how he called upon his mother during that struggle he was going through. And I also find myself reflecting on the sustenance of life, of how mothers sustain lives. And also the story I, I read about uh, the whole gender-based violence in South Africa. And there's one story which really like broke me, which really hit me hard. I think it was three weeks ago of this 20, 28 year old uh, young woman who was found hung in a tree and she was eight months pregnant. And so when I was thinking about motherhood and sustaining, sustaining lives, I, so I started thinking of how the difficulty, the vulnerability that the child could have gone through, the child in a womb could have gone through, uh, waiting to be given food or whatever by the mother only to realize that there wasn't any provisions coming. So I, it really broke my heart and it made me think about how as women we really need to to find ways and means of sustaining lives because we are the ones who give birth to these lives. And so I feel like we really have a lot of work to do to, to get this to an end. It's very, very moving. The thought of a mother boiling stones so that her children think that she's cooking them a meal when she has no food to give them. That really is harrowing. And the woman who was found hanging, she killed herself, did she? Uh, apparently, uh, they, I don't know the evidence of what happened, but there's just suspicions that maybe she was killed. So no one really knows. Yeah. I mean, I think in these are very, very harrowing and powerful stories. And what you say resonates with me on a on a very different level. But you know, as a as a mother and grandmother, um, I felt quite helpless in being unable to give the kind of family support that we would normally give by just going and staying with our children to look to give help with the children you know particularly those who are trying to do full-time jobs from home and the children aren't at school and it becomes very demanding and stressful and I think for many of us as mothers we suddenly found ourselves as you say sort of wondering what does it mean to have given life and to sustain life in times like these um, and to have that sort of physical distance. But your son, where is he, Martha? Who's he staying with? Uh, he's staying with his father in South Africa. He's currently in South Africa now. Yeah. And how old is he? He will be turning four next month. <gasps> That's very painful for you to be so far away and knowing there's a crisis going on. Um, but what you say about us sustaining life. I know that one of your interests is also the extent to which gender-based violence has been, sadly, another consequence of the global pandemic. We hear from all over the world that 
violence, domestic violence, as we we know women are usually the victims of that, not always, but usually, has increased during this time of lockdown and confinement. What's been your experience around that? So I, 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 I've seen a lot of stories of women from different countries, Ghana, Uganda, everywhere, as when they talk about this increase of abuse uh, because of the lockdown, and I reflect on this and say and think that this has been something which has been going on, and I think it's it's it, it never stopped. Of course, there was an increase, but it never stopped, and therefore it's reflecting on on thinking of what can be the possible ways that we can do to to really get this to an end. And I think as women, we it's high time we stop being apologetic about it. That we, we can't continue being victims or survivors. And so it, it's it's really on us to say, how do we put an end to this? That's why I talk about looking out at each other, at each other as women. There's no one who's gonna look out at us. There's no one who's gonna protect us or, or you know, so we need to do it ourselves. And I reflect on this also when I think of the church to say, does the church sustain life? Do you find life in the church? And reflecting as a Catholic woman, I feel like the, looking at a lot of Catholic organizations, Catholic women organizations and all the efforts and all the work that is happening everywhere with Catholic women. And that gives me hope. That also gives me a bit of strength and inspiration to know that there's something happening and there is something which will come out, out of it. And I think we, we it's, it's a matter of not giving up. I read somewhere where someone was saying, why are Catholic women talkative? Like we talk a lot, you, you, you know, speak a lot. But I think it's, it's the more we, we talk that something happens. And I think we shouldn't dismiss it or get out of it because if we don't, who is gonna be sustaining this life even in the church? So I think as women, we need to really like continue bracing ourselves and continue doing what we are doing and, and continue finding ways of sustaining the life that we give birth to wherever we are. And of course, being attached to the Center for Women in Theology in KU Leuven, where I myself have visited many, many times and given seminars and things, you're in a global community of Catholic women there with religious sisters and women from all over the world studying theology, which is an enormously hopeful thing to be part of. What do you think we can do, though, about the many obstacles that there still are in the way of women's voices being heard? as voices of theological authority and wisdom within the formulation of church teaching and church institutions. And so I think, I think uh, the more we speak, which is important to speak, we need to also start moving beyond just speaking or just writing about things. Uh, I read an article online, I think it was the Catholic Outlook, Outlook magazine where uh, Pope Francis was acknowledging the efforts of women during the pandemic, you know, the caregivers, nurses, and things like that. So I think it's one thing being acknowledged, it's one thing being recognized, but it's another thing give, being given a platform. It's another thing being given space to do what you can do and what you are capable of doing. So I think we need to start moving beyond just talking just being acknowledged and really try to find ways and means of getting ourselves there, you know, and taking the lead, which of course is still a struggle, but we can't, we cannot go back. We need really to continue working towards it. And I think, like I said, is when I see all the Catholic women organizations everywhere, it, it, it gives me hope to say, we are getting on to something. And we can't, we can't fall back or we can't get ourselves distracted either. We have to continue fighting towards this as Catholic women. And I know that a lot of women have said that during this time of lockdown, when they haven't been able to go to church, they haven't been able to attend their places of worship, we've had a lot of agitation from church leaders and from some 
people within the church to reopen the churches as soon as possible. But I know many women have found it quite liberating in some ways to be able to take responsibility for the life of faith of their families or their household or having to be inventive and creative about their own faith lives. Do you think when you say we won't go back, do you think that actually out of this pandemic we might see a new confidence among women that we're not going to be pushed back into the pews and told to keep quiet when actually for the past few months we've had to take responsibility for so much? Yes. So, so when I hear you talk about that, I also reflect on what being church is, on what, what church means. So I think it's, it's more of redefining what church is for us and, and also trying to look at how do we move forward. Like you're saying, we have been functioning without literally going to church. So I think it's, it's us moving uh, towards independence and being us as women and knowing that we are capable of, of doing what we can do, doing what we are already doing, but really in a more profound way. So I think I don't see ourselves really going back or being distracted, or I actually think this pandemic may, could have probably uh, brought in a different perspective for us as women, and also brought in a more deeper uh, perspective in sense of know, knowing our capabilities that we can even do something, you know. So, so yeah, I think there is hope. I'm hopeful. We need that message of hope so much because going forward we know that we face monumental challenges ahead i mean maybe the current pandemic is just the beginning of the challenges we face and you will know with people in zimbabwe and south africa particularly the very real threat of huge poverty and need spreading around the world as a result of this so i do i do feel so strongly with you that we need hope because there's an energy in hope I wonder, though, how we can keep that energy going. And I get a very strong feeling that around the world today, we are joining hands. We are. That was an expression that Kocharani Abram from India used when I interviewed her a couple of weeks ago, joining hands around the world. I wonder how we keep that momentum going once we get through the energy of crisis into perhaps the more bleak and relentless struggle that we're going to have to go through all of us to find out what this new normal is and maybe to stop our politicians and our church leaders from just thinking they can slide back into the way things were they can't <laughs> it's a big challenge isn't it yeah. yeah yeah i think i think it's 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 like she talks about joining hands i think it's each person doing something each woman doing something about it because you can't do that alone. We need to be together. So I think even when we go post this crisis, we, we need to continue working together. We can't have everyone going wherever. So I think it's, and it's also trying to think of different initiatives of what we can do so that we keep ourselves really on the loop. Uh, I was thinking about how I could possibly start engaging uh, the Catholic youth to say we need to start having platforms where we have Catholic youths really talking about important issues as youths, as a future church. So we need to start having different initiatives as women to say, how do we keep life in the church? What kind of life do we want for the future church? And it has to start with us for the next generation. And I know from my conversations with members of the Circle of Concerned African Women Theologians and people like Nantanda Hadebi, who I think is currently chair of the Circle, and mm -hmm. Sheila Perez, who presents on Radio Veritas in Johannesburg, I know that youth education is very important for them. And so is educating men about gender-based violence and gender awareness. Um, I guess we look forward to the day when that education finds its way into seminaries as well as classrooms and other institutions. But um, I wonder what you would say to that. How, working together as women, do we raise awareness 
among men to work with us to stop perceiving this as dangerous or threatening or uh, but to see it as a movement for justice that we can all join hands in. It's very difficult to get that message through to some of the men in power in religious institutions particularly. And, and it, it becomes very unfortunate if it doesn't happen first in the church, because then it's everyone looks upon the church. So if it doesn't happen in the platforms of the church, it, it then becomes a little bit difficult to take it out there. But I, th I still think it has to happen eventually like we talk about different masculinities to say, we need to also engage with, we with men. We can't just talk about this without having the engagement of men. And therefore I think in, in the different initiatives that we would take as women, we also need to start reaching out to men. I was having a conversation with one of my, is a priest uh, friend and he was saying, unfortunately when we, we talk about these issues, men always feel threatened. You always feel threatened, whether you are a good guy or not, it, it does impact you in a certain way. So I think it's something we also need to take into consideration when we reach out to say, we are engaging different people with different issues. Therefore, we need to bring everyone on the table so that at least at the end of the day, we are fighting for the same life. And of course, one of the exciting things when we talk about joining hands, you know, often when women like me from the global north raise issues, I can't tell you how often I get told this is just aging discontented feminists from the liberal democracies. African women, they tell me, are so happy with the way things are. Go into any Catholic church and you'll see it's run by the women. And for me, it's particularly good to, have, to be in solidarity with African women like yourself, like many of the others I know who are saying, no, actually, it's not okay for us either. There is a global movement and there is a need for change. So I really appreciate that diversity. But I wonder if you sometimes feel that women in the global north need to take more seriously sometimes the different perspectives and issues that concern women from the global south? Or do you think we're beginning to move towards a more mutual understanding of what we think is needed for change? And so I think uh, there is need, yes, there is need to take in, into consideration the different contexts, different cultures and everything. But at the end of the day, uh, like I talk about life, at the end of the day, we all are fighting towards one thing in different, we are all diverse, yes. We are coming from different contexts, yes. We've got one Catholic church, yes. So, so it's, it, we, we, can't, we, we, we have to acknowledge that we are different but we, can, we have to acknowledge that we have the same problems. We have to acknowledge that we are facing the same challenges in the different contexts where we are. Therefore, getting ideas from e women from everywhere will only bring, will only get us to a solution. So I think it's, it's women from all the contexts acknowledging that we have an issue. Of course, we cannot consider the different contexts where we are coming from. And I think it's also us as women, African women, to also speak out and also be able to speak for ourselves and speak really to the realities that we are facing and not, not let ourselves be silenced and be truthful about it. Because it's, it then come, becomes an issue of all oh, they are speaking on our behalf, things like that. But it's, it's us acknowledging the problem that in the Catholic Church we are having this issue. Therefore, we need to find ways of tackling this issue, however diverse we are. And so, yeah. And of course, um, a woman can feel very vulnerable if she is alone and has experiences of abuse or knows situations of abuse, whether it's sexual abuse or violence or even the sort of abuse of just everyday speech and misogyny. Um, and it seems to me that being able to form networks of support around women who are willing to 
take a stand and to speak out really is important because I don't think it's safe or advisable for women just to go it alone and speaking out when they see things. So it's that challenge again of standing together, letting people speak for themselves, but always being there to support them. So in Catholic Women Speak, for example, when we hear of situations where women have been treated unfairly by church authorities or other situations, we always offer to write collectively so that you know we all put our names to things that need support and it seems to me there's a lot of scope for doing that one of the things we're doing at the moment is sister mary john mananzan from the philippines has been labeled a terrorist and had some terrible things said about her by a government official and i know that many many women around the world well not just women many catholics around the world have um, signed declarations of support for her and that's the kind of situation where I feel we mustn't let these abuses go unchallenged. Yes, and I think it's it's like I talk about different Catholic women organizations. And I think that's where really, for me, that's where really the strength comes in to know that I'm not alone. Like you're talking about the support that you know that you have, because really you can't do it alone as a woman. We really need that kind of support and, and it's, it's inspiration. Great. Martha, before we go, our time is just about up, but I wonder if there's anything else you haven't had a chance to say that you would like to share before we go. Uh, I think uh, I just want to really, taking my context and where I am now, to really applaud all the women, not only Catholic women, but all the women who are everywhere in all the work that they are doing, and just to really encourage everyone to keep doing what they are doing and also to, to keep sustaining the life that we give birth to and in, in very different ways, in different capacities and everything. So I, I think it's just giving uh, I, I, words of encouragement and, and really thanking everyone for what they are doing, that they should keep doing that. Thank you. That's a really lovely note to end on. And I've really enjoyed this opportunity to chat with you and to hear yet another perspective on how women are responding to this global crisis. And I think the messages you give us about the ones who give birth can also be the ones who sustain life. But that means that we stand up, we insist that we're taken seriously, we get listened to, and we have hope as we face the challenges ahead. Those are really important and good messages for us to hear. So Martha, thank you so much for being with me today and go well, stay well. And I hope we get to meet face to face very soon. 